All right, welcome back. We're on the Marketer of the Day podcast, and we're here with David Wolf from audivita.com. That's A-U-D-I-V-I-T-A.com. And now, David is a longtime music composer and producer. He's a media entrepreneur. But most importantly, the focus of today is he is the founder of Audivita Studios. Now, they do audiobooks, they do podcasts, they have a team and a state-of-the-art remote recording process to bring your message to market fast. They work with you to build a strategy, to record, edit your content, distribute it widely, and launch your new audiobook or podcast to market. So we're going to find out how that's done, why that's done, what might hold us up, but how we can blast through all those problems with the help of David and his team and his amazing company. So David, happy to be talking to you. Oh, thanks, Robert. Big, great to be with you. Thanks for, and thank you for the intro. That was lovely. Thank you. Yes, I'm I'm here. That's my job, right? Here to make you look good. So we introed you, but in your own words, what am, what am I leaving out or what really needs focus and attention? Just what, what gets you fired up, energized? What should people notice about you? Yeah, you know, the thing that's really interesting about this whole project, Robert, is as you pointed out, I was a longtime creative guy. So I was the guy years ago when I was 25 years old that decided I wanted to transition from being a musician to being a composer of music. So basically what we call today a content generator, right? But it was music. So I was eventually moved into the, the world they used to call it, maybe they still do jingles, where we were writing music for radio, TV, and film commercials. I did a lot of work in children's programming. And over my career, gradually, by the time I turned 40, I had kind of exhausted the desire to express myself in the world that way and pivoted and wanted to learn more about business. And so flash forward to today, as I moved into creating this company went about six years ago, um, I, the unintended impact of everything we do when we, I'll duck so you can see, we connect <laughs> people's voice to the world. So not only the external clients that we're impacting and really helping them do what they want to do on the planet to have their impact, but we're having an impact on our own employees and our team. And that's not something I saw coming as a person. You know, I did, I thought, well, I'm going to start this company. We're going to make money. I, I'll leverage what I know about production from media and, and do this project. But it was a wonderful unintended co uh, consequence of putting this team together and now, you know, starting to scale a business. So, uh, so I hope that answers your question. Maybe it's a slight tangent, but and it, maybe not the answer you expected, but who knows? But tangents are okay. And that's sort of why we're here on the show to talk about yeah. the, the boring, mundane, run-of-the-mill, ordinary marketing and messaging. And it comes alive and it becomes exciting. I mean, I'm, I'm sure some of these these children's TV shows that you wrote jingles for, at first glance, oh, it's it's such a slog, but then you do the work, you have fun, and everything is temporary anyway, right? I mean, someday the, the world will blow up, the sun will blow up, the universe will have the heat death, so it's all temporary, and the best we can hope for is in the years that we're here to take this ordinary day-to-day -day minutia and really make it come alive and make it magical. And I'm sure that you've seen this sort of thing happen even, even today, right, with your team and your clients and their podcasts and their audiobooks. Hey, man, it's all about process. You know, it's funny. I love that that way, that framework you just laid out. In our audiobook production process, when we're selling this to authors or publishers on behalf of their authors, we have a wildly successful program where we remotely record authors reading their own audio, uh, their own audiobooks using remote you know, software that's designed to do this, uh, high quality, studio quality, with a producer there with video. And, you know, you got it's a very interesting situation. The dynamics are you got an author who's, you know, written their baby. They're the talent. So they're actually on mic reading. And it requires a certain level of emotional intelligence to be able to gently coach an author reading their own book. And it's a wide spectrum of capacity. Some authors are very good and fluid at reading and others are not so fluid and good. So you have to coach them and tease the best, the most connective performance out of them to serve their audience and grow their brand. Right. And, and get the book into people's ears and in this, with this intimate one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one audio environment. So um, we talk about how we, manage that and we say that the process the moment of the doing the recording the process of doing it is as or more important than the final product because out of that 
something magical happens in terms of media training, in terms of reconnecting with your own material as the author, grounding yourself in what you've already written and orating it again with someone there to help you do it. It's a very interesting process. So again, it's all about the present moment. What, what are we doing to make this moment exciting and electric? You know, and you know, from podcasting, when a podcast is starting out, they don't have a big audience. So we, maybe you've called it too. I like to call it the audience of one, you know, it's, they're one person on a mic with them sharing a moment together. Something good might happen. And we hope it does. So, I love it. And, and it's good to have this awareness and to get people just knowing what's possible here, because this whole idea here of you have an author and they, you know, they've looked into the options, right? They say, OK, if I've heard audiobooks are great. I heard a stat like a few hours ago that audiobooks this year are overtaking print books, which is um, crazy and amazing. And so some author says, OK, well, I've written my baby, as, as we said. And they want to have the audiobook version, but they look at their options. They say, well, I could pay this, like, this, uh, some other talent to narrate it for me. Well, I don't like that because it's not my voice. Then they say, well, I could go into a recording booth. I have to pay this hourly rate, and I'm not even sure what I'm doing. That's not good, too. So they want to record it in their home, on their own schedule, on their own convenience. So it's great to know that this option exists where they can kind of do it on their own terms, on their own time, and have this person uh, kind of dial in and coach them through. And so, and and that way they can get the best of both worlds. And it seems like that's where that's where the, the magic of business happens and where the money's made. Where we, we find the, the missing gap, right? We say, there's this extreme, there's that extreme. People say, you know, I'm just, I'm missing out on this audiobook opportunity because I can't do either extreme. Here we are right in the middle, fixing problems. That's a, that's a very interesting positioning that you care, the way you characterize it. I think we were one of the first companies that actually accepted the idea of having authors read their own. You know, the, the large publishers traditionally have not been open to this idea at all. They have studios, they've got talent, they want to make sure it's perfect or you know professionally performed i want to make a distinction this is mostly we're applying this um, approach to production with a non-fiction title when you get into fiction where you've got dialogue and you've got characterizations and you've got dialects and you've got a story arc and emotional expression it, it really does require the skill of an actor to pull that off and land for the listener in a way that the, the story is really translating for them uh, with an author's vision uh, but for a nonfiction author, I always like to say, or I often say, if you're your connect, if you're the voice of your brand, if you're the connectivity to market, then it makes so much sense for this to happen in your voice. I have had a lot of conversations with authors who have done a previous audiobook, not the way we do it. And they said, yeah, you know, I did the book. People, my fans said, yeah, it sounds like you're writing, but who's that other person that was your imposter, you know, kind of a thing. So I think there's a lot of value, even though it's not perfect. It's them being them authentically for their audience. And particularly if they're a podcaster or they're guesting on other people's podcasts, it, it helps connect with that voice brand that they are. So, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the voice brand, like how you have the same colors on your book and on your website, everything just matches all across. And so, yeah, you know, yeah, since... Continuity. Yeah, continuity. And we're in the day and age where people are allowed to be curious and they can be voyeurs. And maybe they say, you know, I I've thought about this audiobook thing, this remote recording thing, looked into Audivita, and maybe they're here just snooping on you and me. So what do you think they're thinking now? Like what's going through their head? What excuses, objections are they making up to say, ah, oh, I still can't do this? Like what do people say before they become an Audivita customer and, and see the light of day? That's such a beautiful question. So, you know, there's price sensitivity in the market. That's the first thing that comes to mind. It is not an expensive to do an audio book the way we're describing with a producer there, making sure that everything, everything's the performance is in touch, retakes, outtakes, all the audio post-production and mastering in order for, so that it's in compliance with the distribution ecosystem. Very particular about audio. If you can't try this alone, if you don't know how to do audio editing and you don't have experience as an audio engineer, it's very hard to get this right. There are all kinds of specs and compliance issues that you have to deal with. So you're relying on us for that. So I say to them, well, you're paying for that too. But I'll say this, uh, Robert, there are four ways we do this to sort of address the price sensitivity factor. And that is we could record the whole book linearly, just like we described. Typically, it's a series of 90 minute recording sessions, as many as it takes. We price by the word, um, you know, pricing changes over time. 
Uh, as we speak today, we charge 10 cents a word for everything I'm going to describe. Recording with a producer, editing, post-production, mastering, around revisions, modify the cover to be a square, upload it to your account, and we're out. So that's a 10 cent a word today. We're in February of 2024, just in case you're listening in the tale. So that's the first way we do it. Then we have a program where we can clone the author's voice. It only takes 90 minutes of recording time remotely. And then we go into full production and that, that uh, lowers the, 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 the cost hurdle for the author about 40%. That knocks about 40% of the cost off of an author's, you know, off, off of the cost if they were to do it the entire book. And sometimes, you know, you laugh, AI, it, it does a better job of being you than you, you know, only because it's more perfect than you might have done. But it does lack some of the sort of emotional content or characteristics that are hard to, um, hard to, uh, identify but we know they affect people's psychology as they're listening uh this is the nature of ai it's it's not doesn't vary the phrasing enough the cadence is often repeating you know there's things about ai that are not that don't land like a human let's say well then they call um, that the then, uncanny valley right is that the yes, term I, that may be i actually haven't heard that term but it sounds good uh <laughs> There also are limitations right now with the distribution acceptance. Uh, well, I'll say it this way. The acceptance by the distribution ecosystem, Amazon and Audible uh, do not accept all AI. It requires prior permission, which is code for we can't guarantee we're going to get you on. So uh, the 52 other places you can be, including Apple, they'll take it. But you do have limitations with which with Amazon and Audible, which is, you know, 70, 80 percent of the market. So that is an obstacle to the second way of doing it, uh, but it is a cost reducer. And so the, the third way that they can, we, we can um, address the objection of price sensitivity is they could do an abridged version of their audio. So rather than doing the 50,000 word version, they'll cut it in half, do 25,000 uh, words, and that cuts their price roughly in half. And now it's an affordable way to participate in the growing audiobook market without paying so much and being concerned about uh, budget. So some ideas there. I would say that's the, the largest objection. So the next one would be time. And, you know, we can solve for that as well in some cases. But um, beyond that, it's been a very successful program. Wonderful. And it's good to have choices. It's good to have options. Nothing is ever perfect, right? And it's like yeah. the, the joke is you get two out of three, right? You can have it. Right. It can be uh, cheap or it can be uh, good or it can be fast. And so this way people can say, okay, well, maybe I want to go the full way and have it uh, fully my voice and go through the coaching or do the voice cloning, which gets us uh, cheaper, but only gets us some places. So it's just, it's good to be educated and to make these sorts of decisions. And so we've talked about this whole idea of the audiobook production. It's great to have these new ways of doing it if someone previously thought that they were blocked. And then you also are big with podcasting. So what's that about? If someone says, okay, I've heard about podcasting or I want a podcast or maybe the past podcast failed and now I know I need a, a better support team, where do you come in and how are you guys different with podcasting? I, I think with podcasting, you know, there are, there are a lot of, and you are one of them, there are a lot of entrepreneurs that have started podcast production companies. Companies. Um, where we sit is where I like to think we're kind of premium white glove, a little higher price point. Uh, you know, I come from broadcast media, as does most of my team. So we 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 really value production and the quality of production, whether it's the video intros and outros with motion graphics and making things really look broadcast wise, the lower thirds, all of those things are important to us as a team. And uh but that said, we do encounter, you know, a spectrum of need throughout the people we talk to that want to work with us. And so we found over time that it's we have found it best to do some level of customization in order to so that the client can select the things they they need us to do and deselect the things that they don't feel they need us. They want they desire or value or want to pay for Um but we're not a click to buy operation where it's a gold, silver, bronze kind of a solution. It's it's a it's an engaged conversation about strategy, uh, about the flow and of the show, um, about uh, the positioning of uh, their intro and outro, the music choice, 
if there is music in an intro and out in an outro um we typically again we're very engaged so we're showing up as a producer on the sessions some of our clients do decide that they don't want to pay us to be there on their sessions so we might do a test session to make sure everything sounds and looks good and then we'll let them do their own thing on zoom or wherever uh but most of our clients have us there with them and we're involved in the scheduling matrix and making sure everything's coordinated and um like that so the podcast um as you know, is it, it's evolving. It's an evolving market. When we started in this business, there was no video. Uh, there may be a little bit of a YouTube here and there, but it wasn't like I have to have. And almost everyone we're talking to now, there's some video component, even if it's an audiogram where we're taking parts of their audio series and then we're creating a short video clip to put on social. There's some video component with the promotion, if not the actual show itself. And I'm sure you have found the same as you're in the market as well. Oh yeah, and it continues to evolve, right? Because and I'm and as much as the pandemic was bad, I'm so grateful for the pandemic for getting the video aspect figured out. Because before that, it was slow, it was choppy, it would break up, and now video is expected. And as you said, with the audiograms, and that's turned into the reels, and then now it's turning into with uh, Chat GPT, you transcribe it and you morph it into blog posts and other sorts of material and it just continues yeah. to add more moving parts which is okay i mean it's not okay if it's just you doing it alone but if there is someone like you and a team and people that are dialed into all these things then you can really stand out from your competition who is not dialed into all these channels right maybe they're just posting it and that's it but if you yeah. are the one that's hosting every day on all these social platforms and getting all this keyword ranking and, and making all these things happen, then that's a great way to stand out. And so how do we make sure that the the podcast and the audiobooks actually get traffic and get attention and, and make a difference? Like it's easy enough in, in it, like, you know, with, with authors, with audiobooks, et cetera, to just create the content and then don't market. So what do you either do or what do you recommend as far as after the content's created, getting it out there, getting it marketed? Well, you're pointing to something that's a very, very, um, a, a huge need in the market right now. Uh, it's not core to our business. We will produce the assets. We, you and I talked about it a moment ago, the, the little video clips, the snippets of uh, uh, posts that you can put in here, a blog article, because we've got help with AI and we can produce those things and we can add those things to our clients arsenal and then hand it off to them for their internal team or for them to then crawl into their uh, social accounts using whatever platform they use. And, uh, and, and so we provide the production, but we don't actually do marketing and, and more and more. And I think you're probably finding too, that uh, in all reality, there's, there's, maybe a de-emphasis over time on the production value and more emphasis on how do I grow? How do I grow? How do I grow? So consequently, one of the things I'm doing is I'm launching a, a new company that will be a holding company that does production, but also has um, companies within it that are uh, by design marketing uh, or social media or lead generation types of facilities so that we can help our clients solve those problems. Um, one of the things that we determined uh, over time is that while a lot of our clients ask us how we can help them with marketing, we learned fairly quickly that it was best for us to stay in the production lane. That's the thing we really know. It's what we have systems for and workflow for, and we're good at it. And as soon as we start to go, this team starts to move into things we're not so good at, it doesn't always go so well. So we tested it and found that it's better that we just do production and not help with that problem. But I have absolutely identified it. And to your question, this is a more direct, that was sort of my entrepreneurial answer. To the yeah. clients, I say, you have to promote, you telegraphed it a minute ago. It's what we all know. You have to be on as many channels as you can, where your audience is, and uh, doing it consistently with a cadence in order to get momentum. And it ain't easy. You have to spend as much on that as you did on the book, maybe more, maybe more, you know, in the case of an audiobook or any. Really, when you're marketing an audiobook, you're marketing all the versions. And when you're marketing a podcast, you know, it's funny with podcasting too, and I know we're short on time. It's With podcasting, it's interesting because at a certain point, there's sort of a spectrum of podcasts and why you do it. At one end, the B2B is I want to get more leads, more clients, close more deals, grow my business using podcasts as an as a marketing, a subset of my marketing program, my platform online. Then there's the pure entertainment podcasts 
which we hear about, which are with celebrities or their narratives or, you know, it's true crime. And that's a world we're actually participating in that world. We have a division that does original series stuff. It's a hard game, man. But I'll tell you that that's where the podcast is the product. It's and, and in that world, you really have to promote or sell it to a network, you know, so that they can then spend the money necessary to drive that traffic and get it to ignite, you know, in the market. So none of this is easy. It's not easy. And that's okay, though. That's just uh, life is a cruel world. And it's not supposed to be <laughs> it doesn't have to be. And you think of how many talented musicians are out there, right? And I mean, yeah. like, it, it takes a certain kind of mind for you to be a musician, right? And like, there's like a mathematical side and a hardworking yeah. side and an entrepreneurial yeah. side. And there's so much talent out there. But there's also yeah. a lot of starving artists, not everyone can make it big. And then sometimes people kind of it becomes a hobby, or they become a music teacher or they become a wedding DJ, but you've accomplished something amazing here. You've taken your skills and talents and said, Hey, how do we apply it to these clients and have and help them out and really breathe the the magic and the entertainment into what they have and grow and in the, your past lives, grow the children's shows and now grow the audiobooks and grow the podcast and make these things happen. And so if someone says, okay, I, you've convinced me, I want to at least check this out. I know that I need this remote recording so that way I do my audiobook right. I do my podcast right. What's the next step here? How does someone find out about Audivita? And once they land on the site, what should they be doing? Thank you so much for asking. It all starts with a, with a discovery call. That's typically how we work. Um, you can find us on LinkedIn. Uh, Audivita is the, uh, you know, the handle, uh, you can go to our website directly, which is triple W.audivita.com. There it is. It's like the car Audi Vita. It's two Latin words, uh, the sound of life. Nice. And, uh, you can go there. There's the contact us form. That's another way to reach us. Um, send, uh, an email to me directly. If you like a D Wolf, like my first initial last name at audivita.com is another way. So all of those ways, all the usual suspects and uh, we'll book a discovery call. We'll learn more about what it is you're trying to accomplish, whether you're an author, a publisher of authors books, we work with and partner with a lot of sort of what I like to call one to many, where we have publishers that have working with authors and they're sending us multiple projects and we become their white label or their a, a trusted referral partner to help them augment their team with a world that's very specific. Not everybody can do audio. Most publishers know how to do print. So we become the uh, adjunct uh, uh, to their team. Uh, so anyway, that's that's where we are, audivita.com. Very nice and very fun and very cool. And people really undervalue what you're mentioning here of just having a, a harmless phone call because a lot of people don't do it, right? A lot of people are just so afraid and so shy just to have that quick conversation. And I've had conversations where maybe the timing wasn't quite right just yet, got to know right. the person when the timing was ready, then I went and signed up, or maybe there was the referral situation that happened, or you know, even sometimes I thought I knew something and then i had a conversation like this and i was like oh i need to go back and and like get some of these other things in my business figured out and then come back to you so it might be a harsh wake-up call but uh change needs to happen somehow right and change yeah. won't happen if you keep sitting on the sidelines and you don't go to audivita.com but when you make the next step and take the risk and be glad you did later then you can send that email to dwolf at a-u-d-i-v-i-t-a.com dwolf at audivita.com and just talk about this podcast and audiobook possibilities share your your book and your hopes and dreams with david and his team and just see what can happen then that is a step in the right direction so that way you don't have to continue to be frustrated and go it alone and wonder what might have been get your podcast out there get your audiobook done and have david and his team help you do it and as we're winding up and wrapping down our conversation here david i always like to ask about some wise advice because we everyone has some kind of quote or lesson that can really just energize us and send us on our way. So with all of your many decades of musical and podcast and audiobook experience, does anything jump out as you, at you as far yeah. as a helpful yeah. quote or lesson to help us? Yeah, the, the, the thing that's very, um, it's uh, indigenous to the way I've lived. And I've always believed that, you know, find joy in the work you do. You know, find 
the thing you love to do and integrate those things. I've always been a much more integrative approach as opposed to work and play being compartmentalized. So in my life, that's what I've tried to do. And I've been very, very fortunate and lucky and uh, blessed that I've been able to, for the most part, I've, I've lived my life my way. But everyone listening and watching can do that as well. You just have to step back. You know, I practice meditation. And when I started meditating about seven years ago, it really began to give me some perspective about these sorts of things. And I'm happy to talk to anybody about any of these things as well. We don't just have to, you know, we're not transactional. When when we do our discovery calls, sure, we're in business, but it, it may, I've talked people out of doing an audio book because there just wasn't time for them. It, it, they'd be better off spending money on marketing their print book. You know, I, that's the way we roll. And that's the way I like to roll is I'd like to just, I'd rather show like you did today in a generous way, uh, with uh, the gift of some experience and insight that may be helpful, uh, help. And if there's a transaction, wonderful, even better. But it's not it's not the why. You're a person with judgment and personality. Imagine that. And Thank so you. you say the intersection of joy and work is where we should go. And where we should also go is right now, run, don't walk to adavita.com. We will see you there. And thank you very much, David, for a pleasant conversation. Thanks for having me, Robert.